As we pray over our nation today and we look towards July 4th, I, I want to take a moment here in the middle of the year, and I want to pause just from walking from Ephesians 1 and 2 into Ephesians chapter 3, and I want to look into what, what has Paul been saying to us, and what is this all about? Where are we headed with this? What's going on? <clears throat> as an opportunity to take a moment in the middle of the year to look back at our, our theme for the year, to be strengthened in the faith. Ephesians 6 says that we would be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And what that really means for us. What is God really doing in us and calling us to? Because what we've seen up to this point, I hope, has been laying a foundation for strengthening your faith. Now, I say that very particularly because I, what I don't pray is that all that we've laid is all the strength that your faith is. And I hope that comes out this morning, that, that there's so much more. Paul, we're not done with Ephesians. We're one third of the way through the book. We've made Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2. There's so much more to it that God is going to call us into and call us to be and to do for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the king. So I want to begin today, and I'm going to just jump right into this because I have a lot of ground to cover, and I want to, there's, there's a challenge in my spirit today that I have to get out, a call for all of us. And, and now I've said this, I don't know how many times, it's true every Sunday, but particularly today. I can only preach to you what God has been speaking to me. So there's a reason why all of my slides typically say something like, I must do this, or I must do that. If I was just preaching to you, I would say, you must do this, you must do that. But this is for me as much as it's for you, okay? So as I talk in singular pronouns, I'm talking about me and I'm talking about you, and I want to personalize that as well as, as really call it in all of us. So as we look at this uh, in the beginning here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, he says that we were strangers and foreigners. He says that you're no, so you now are no longer foreigners and strangers. Now you are citizens together with God's holy people. You belong to God's family. Now this is important because it says now you're no longer foreigners and strangers, which means, obviously, we've talked about this, that we were at one time strangers and foreigners, Right? But now we're citizens. We once were far off and separated and, and foreigners and strangers to the covenant promises of God, all those things we've talked through. Now we are not. Now we are belonging and we're becoming and we're, we're being loved by God and we're doing all those things we talked about last week. We are no longer strangers and foreigners. But here's the thing. We are still strangers and foreigners. Once we were strangers and foreigners to the faith, now we are strangers and foreigners to the flesh. Where we once were far off to our faith, now we are foreigners and strangers to the flesh. In fact, Peter, another disciple, says in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Beloved, I urge you as strangers and foreigners. This is the disciple talking to fellow Christians. As strangers and foreigners to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul that we are now still strangers and foreigners, but we're strangers and foreigners to the flesh that wages war in our soul. There is a war going on, and we have to realize it. It happens in your life every single day. And you are being called to be a warrior in this fight. Being strengthened in our faith means that we know how to war against our flesh because this world is no longer our home. We once were strangers and foreigners to our faith, to the kingdom. Now we are strangers and foreigners to this world. He goes on to say, keep your conduct among the, amongst the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now think about this. He's saying, keep your contact among, amongst the world in the Gentiles. Out there in the world, keep your conduct honorable. So when they speak against you as evildoers, anybody see an irony there? Your, your conduct is honorable, and they're calling that evil. 
because that's how society works. That's the culture. We see that right now today. You don't have to go very far to pull a correlation between this verse and what Peter is saying to the early Christians to what's going on in the news right now. You stand up for the pre-born. You stand up for ending birthday abortion. And they call that evil. When you do what's honorable, they speak and say it's evil. So do it in such a way. Be a warrior against the flesh in such a way that when they see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation, that when, when Jesus finally comes on that day, the day of visitation, when that day happens, that moment of judgment for them, they'll realize, oh, and then they'll glorify God. They'll see your good deeds. There's something for us to do that will glorify God for the day of visitation. Now, all of this is laying a map for us today. I want you to to see these, I want to put some landmarks down and then we'll come back to them because it says we may see our good deeds. There's something for us to do for the glory of God, for the purposes of what he's doing on the day of visitation. Because Jesus, from the very beginning, has always had the end in mind. We've talked through Ephesians chapter one, that before the foundation of the world, you were chosen, that there's he came, that Jesus Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. All of these things that have, we've been walking through and talking about the whole time, Jesus has had the big picture in mind. And here's the great part, that even when we don't, when we make choices that don't honor him, when we step away, when we begin to walk in a direction that's not right for the purposes that he has for us, Jesus knows what we choose and he makes room for what we choose. He's okay with us wandering a little bit as we're trying to figure this out. So, but there, there's a call for that. There's a challenge in that that we need to step into. Because depending on where you are in your walk with Christ right now, what you're choosing or what you're not choosing, kind of like that famous line, this could be the best of times or the worst of times for you. If you are engaged in the battle, if you are engaged in the war, if you are engaged in the fight, this could be the best of times for you. If you're not, I've lived in the not, and I've lived in the now. If you're not, then this could be not so much fun. Because if you've been in that place where you're not engaged in the battle, <laughs> You know what I mean when I say that there's nothing as miserable as a Christian who's trying to straddle living in the world and living for the kingdom. I did it for 17 years, calling it an IT job. I did it for 17 years, chasing after this and sort of kind of living this way. And it was miserable. My spirit was torn every single day. And now it's different. Now it's not like, oh, now it's roses because I get my paycheck from the church. I'm uncompensated staff. No, it's not about my paycheck. It's about my attitude and my intention and my engagement in the battle. So this is, I'm coming on a little strong. I'm going to dial it back a notch. Okay. I'm, I'm fired up. Yeah. So, okay. We have an opportunity we have an opportunity, I believe this, okay? I believe that we have an opportunity today, right now, not, not literally today, but in this current timeline, in this season, we have an opportunity to be a part of something that's changing the world. There was a time when you had to be in Greenwich Village. You had to be in Birmingham. You had to be at Berkeley. You had to be in Tiananmen Square in order to be a part of some thing that was going to change and shift the world. And people would look at that and they point back to that and they say, that moment changed the world. But now through the power of technology and the Holy Spirit, we are engaged from right here in Clownmore, Oklahoma. And even more than that, we are engaged in a way that God has strategically aligned us if you look at the hot spots for the kingdom, destiny life is in the war zone. We're in China. 
connected relationally. We're in Pakistan, connected, growing, building relationally. We're in Venezuela, connected, growing, building relationally. We're in these major hotspots and we have an opportunity as the church to make an impact, to be a part of a revolution and a reformation. I'm gonna share with you a few stories at the end here. And one of those is a founding father of that major reformation that came out of the, the great transformation, reformation from Martin Luther. And we have an opportunity to be a part of something like that, but we must engage at a much deeper and stronger level. And as you do that, you'll begin to live out your purpose for God. And here's something I've noticed, I've recognized, you've heard Glenn talk about this, that we, when you begin to engage at that level, when you begin to, to dive into the word, you begin to read the word, then you'll begin to see and understand the scripture according to out of your engiftment and calling that God has put into your life. As you begin to read the scripture and it becomes alive to you, then you begin to see it through the filter of your purpose and calling. You've heard Glenn talk about when during the 80s, when the Lord was speaking to him about what it looked like to be stepping into being an apostolic center, that everything he read in scripture, whether it was Genesis or Revelation or anything in between, it was all about order and government and what God was doing. And he couldn't read anything without seeing that. And I see the same thing, except I see purpose and calling and, and God's placement. And I want to do that for you. I've told you before, I believe that one of the purposes of my life is to help you discover your purpose. So I can't read the word without God calling out, you're on a mission. This is your purpose. This is the will of God for you. All those things, the promises that God has for us and the purpose and calling he's called you into. I want, I want you to see that. And if you're not seeing that, it means one of two things. This is a side note. I'm probably not going to make it through all the notes. So I probably should fill in the blanks for you today because we're just not going to get there. The, what God is saying, there's one of two things. Either you're not spending enough time in the word to have your engiftment come out, or you haven't recognized that that's your engiftment yet. So you need to spend more time in the word so it'll come out. So... Either way, the answer is spend more time in the Word. Because as you begin to do that, as you begin to read that, you'll begin to see some theme. There's, a, there's something to what David calls in the Psalms, the whole counsel of God. There's this main idea. What's the big theme? What's God really up to? Because I'll be really honest with you, Coming into salvation just for the idea of getting me out of here isn't that appealing. When you think about it, when we, we look at that, it's not, very, it's not a very motivating statement for me to say that salvation is about getting you off the planet. I mean, you're telling me that the God who is capable of creating everything sent his son to die so that I could get out of here? Like that just doesn't connect for me. There's not enough there that makes sense. God could have done that a different way. And if that was it, then why don't we just zap out of here like Star Trek transport as soon as we're saved, right? If the purpose is to get off of this planet, why doesn't that happen? And then let's not even get into the description that we have of heaven, right? You know, the idea of sitting around for millions of years sharing our testimony and floating around with, you know, sheets on and playing harps. Like that's, none of that is appealing to me. I'm sorry. It's not. But that's not what it is. And that's not what it's about. And that's not the main theme. That's not even close. But we're called to, to engage culture. In fact, it kind of begs the question, are we fishing the wrong way? Dennis Peacock has this joke. He says that we're the only fishermen who fish and expect the fish to come to the sporting goods store. We're the only fishermen who fish and we expect to tell the fish what they're supposed to eat today, what you're going to bite on. And we're using words like, you know, Jesus came to be the propitiation for your sins and sinners are going, okay, whatever. And we're not engaging there. In fact, there's a really interesting picture here I want to show you about what it looks like to really engage culture. It happens with Jesus in John chapter 3. And this man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night. And he says to him, Rabbi, 
We know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus isn't going around screaming at people. He's showing the kingdom. This is what power and transformation in the kingdom looks like, and it's attractive. Now, here in the beginning, it's attractive, and this cultural mountain of religion and education, Nicodemus, comes to him. Can you go back to that other slide? Uh, He comes to him at night, and he says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And this is the world's response. Because you and I, none of us would deny that this is true about Jesus. Is he a teacher? Yes. Is God with him? Yes. But is that the whole truth of who he is? No. He's not just a teacher. He's the savior. And he's not just, God is not just with them. He is God. But Nicodemus packages this really nicely and culture does the same way. And It's why we have to have command and control of the language because when you can frame the conversation, you can control the culture. And that's what Nicodemus is trying to do here. He's framing this conversation, but what he's really asking is, Jesus, I'm not allowed to ask you this, but who are you and where did you come from? That's what he's really saying. Jesus doesn't bite. In fact, he brings the kingdom to him. And Jesus replied, he says, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus sitting there alone with the creator of the universe. And he can't see the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, the answer you're looking for, you can't get in this place as a foreigner and a stranger to the faith. You have to be a foreigner and a stranger to this world, to the flesh. You have to be born again. And then he doesn't say, you'll get out of here. (laughs) He doesn't say, then the transport will happen, the ethereal sparkles will happen and you'll disappear and you'll appear in heaven. He doesn't say that. He says, then you'll see the kingdom of God. But something happens in us when we're born again, that we are born. And you and I, we are born to grow. The kingdom doesn't just leave us there. I was born to grow into more. In fact, we're, when we're born again, the analogy of being born is, is a perfect example of what we really are in the faith. We are born as spiritual babies. These little infants, these little babies that need everything. And we, we relate as spiritual babies and as spiritual infants and toddlers. The problem is that we stay there. Many Christians don't have an understanding of what this is really about. If it's just about get me out of here and no more, there's no reason to engage culture. There's no reason to be an impact for good. There's no reason to walk in the good that God has called you to because my purpose is just accept Christ, follow the faith and get gone. And so we stay there. In fact, 1 Peter says it like this, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. We're babies spiritually, but we must long for pure spiritual milk that we will grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted, if indeed you have seen the kingdom of God, then you'll grow up. And we're being called to grow up. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Why are you rejected by men? Because now you are a foreigner and a stranger to this world. And when you live as a living stone being built into what God is doing. You are being built up. You're being grown up into your faith and into your calling and into your purpose. Then you will experience rejection from the world. 
We're being called to grow up. We are a holy priesthood that offers spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. This looks like I can't live with one foot in one place and one foot in another. My offering, my sacrifice to be acceptable has to be all in. And so we're called, we're born to grow. I was born to grow. When we're born again, we're spiritual babies, but then we begin to grow and you know, it's like, oh, that little baby's so cute. No, he pooped his diaper, that's so good. You know, and then at some point you have to say, okay, it's time for you to get out of that. We have some potty training to do, and then we have some walking to do, and then we have some running to do, and we begin to grow up, and now it's taking on responsibilities. I'm, I'm in that phase right now with Ethan where we're talking more about responsibilities, and I'm giving him more and more chores and things to do because he needs to own it. He's being grown up. God is the same way. He establishes his love for us, that he is a good, good father, that he loves you unconditionally, that he has the best for you. He is a good provider. He is a good protector. He is a good father to you. That's what Paul has been saying all through Ephesians 1. God selected you and God saved you and God has sealed you. And you can know that he loves you and this is why and this is what he's done and this is why he's doing it. And he unpackages all of that in Ephesians 1. Why? Because he's laying a foundation for spiritual babies to be grown up into salvation. Problem comes when we stay there. When we love that place so much that we don't want to grow up. And that's our problem. My problem, it's personal, right? My problem is I don't want to grow up. It's so much better. I mean, think about it, right? You go back to when you were in high school and when you were in eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, how many of you would love to go back to the good old days, right? Running around without shoes on and hunting frogs like Shepard. I mean, it was just, that was some good stuff and I didn't realize how good I had it. Spiritually, we're the same way. We are stuck here and we, we, we do that. And you can look at, it's really grieving to me. You look at mainstream Christian music and you can see this pattern. Everything is about how much Jesus loves me and that he's gonna remove me from this storm and he's gonna help me through this difficulty and God's gonna do it for me and God loves me, God loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. The reality is at some point, we don't need to be spiritual babies anymore. We need to be mature men and women who can be engaged by the Holy Spirit on behalf of God's purpose for the nations. We need to mature, to grow up. Because here is the fact, Jack. I don't grow up, (laughs) that was bad, scratch that from second service, okay? I don't grow up because I want to. I grow up because I have to. There's nothing that I could do to stop this 40-year-old guy from turning 40 this year. I don't grow up because I want to. I grow up because I have to. And you and I have to grow up. We're being strengthened this year to grow up. We're being challenged and pressed and pushed to grow up because I must grow up into the purpose that God has for me. God has a purpose for me and I'll never be able to walk it, to run hard after God if I don't grow into that. If I stay as a spiritual infant stuck in this pattern of Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, I'm okay, he's a good father, he'll take care of me, everything's all right. If I stay there, I'll never be able to walk in the purpose that God has for me. Because the real reason we're saved is not to get out of here and get off the planet. The real reason is that Jesus prayed, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. I can assure you there are no problems in heaven right now. And Jesus is saying, bring that kingdom down here. Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter one. 
In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. I point this out. I highlighted these two words to show you this is your salvation. This is your being born again, redemption and forgiveness. You are saved and you are forgiven. You are reborn by his blood into all, and given to us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose. Here's the big plan, God's big plan for the fullness, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. It does not say that in the purposes and the fullness of time to get you out of here. Never. It's not there. The plan and purpose of God is not for us to leave the planet, but to bring the kingdom to the planet. So what does it mean to live for that? What does it mean to grow up into who we are in Christ to live for that? I want to break that down into three areas. The first one is what it means to live for the kingdom in your purpose. I love the jellyfish dolphin analogy. It's a perfect analogy because we live in a culture of moving tides. There is constantly a tide of culture that is ebbing and flowing and pushing us around. There are oceans of culture that have very powerful tides. And if you are an infant, when you step into the water of the ocean, you feel the water on your toes and your parents are there to make sure that the undertow doesn't drag you away, right? That riptide that will pull you under. Some of you that just came back from Florida are saying, yes, that is very real. And if you are a jellyfish, then you are sucked out by that tide and you are tossed around, as James 1 says, by every wave of the cultural tide that's throwing you around. But if you are a dolphin, then you can swim against the tide. You can swim against the currents of culture. If you are a dolphin, then you can swim against it and you can swim towards truth and godliness and holiness. And you can swim against the oceans of culture that are waving and crashing. There is no if in that. We are in, you can't live in this world and not be engaged in culture in some way. But you have a choice. We do swim in cultural oceans and we do have an opportunity to be alive is to be culture shaped by the world. And that's why Jesus prayed in John 17, 15. I do not ask that you take them out. If I can't, I'm gonna beat this horse. If I can't make this any clearer, Jesus says it right here. I'm not asking you, God, to take them off the planet, but that you keep them from the evil one. You're here for a purpose, to live it out. Jesus is very aware. He says, my disciples are stuck here. They're placed here, and I want you to keep them. They need to be protected. They need to be able to swim like dolphins against the culture. The New Testament calls us to this over and over and over. There are several examples here. I'm not going to hit all these in the sake of time, but I, you, I put the verse references there. You can look them up on your own. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Ephesians 4, 17. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Swim against the way that the world thinks what he's saying. 1 John 2.15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Swim against loving the world. John 15, Jesus said, if the world hates you, know this, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own because you wouldn't be a stranger and you wouldn't be a foreigner, but it has rejected you. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. This is what it means to be a dolphin. We're so full of the Holy Spirit. We're so full of the Holy Spirit's courage and power and boldness and strength 
that we can swim against the cultures and the tides of our day, and we can swim against what's going on in the world in the place that God has called you for your purpose for the kingdom, to make his kingdom come and his will be done. And that's what it takes to be a Christian, living for the kingdom. And what does it mean to live for the kingdom in your problems? Because problems come. Here's the thing. We say it all the time. It's a wonderful day for you, right? When problems come, the troubles come to grow you up. As a baby, when the Holy Spirit begins to bring trouble into your life, we begin to say something like, we begin to blame the enemy and he's trying to, to help us and to hold us down. But what God is trying to do, the Holy Spirit is doing, is he's trying to build you up, to grow you up. Problems in our lives are really only come from two places. Either they're problems that God allows or our stupidity produced. That's, well, that's me anyway, I guess I could say. My problems come from one of two places, usually both. God allowed it and my stupidity produced it. You can let yourself off the hook or you can face the truth. Either way, your problems in your life are there to grow you up, to make you strong. Don't downplay them. To remove the problem from your life is frequently to remove the process of growing up farther away. It moves us back to square one, so we have to go back around the mountain again. Think about what would have happened if the Israelites got to the Red Sea and Moses hadn't stood up and said, no, we're going through it. If he had listened to them to say, why did you bring us out here to die? At least we could go back to three square mills and slavery every day. If he had not said, no, this is a problem that God can take care of, we're going to go through it. If Jericho, if Joshua had not led the enemy into that first battle in the promised land, they would have never infiltrated all that God had for them and the promises that he had for them. David had never faced Goliath. Israel would still be under the oppression of Philistines. Your problems are not there. And he would have never been identified as the sovereign king. That was the catapulting moment that put him into the eyes of the nation. Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. The sway of public opinion happened because he fought one battle. Because he stood in the midst of that problem. Your problems are not there to bring you off course. They're there because God has allowed them to grow you up into who he's called you to be. Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece. You are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared in advance that you should walk in them. He's called you to do this thing. Walk in it as rough and tough as it may look and as it may be. The John Ray version of this verse is, God created you for a mission. You are on a mission for the kingdom and for the king. I've started teaching my boys that in the line. Do good always for the kingdom and for the king. It's my hope someday, this is waxing eloquent, I'm sorry, it's just my romantic side of me, but... My hope someday is that they're in the midst of some really difficult struggle in their own life. And I look at them and they say, I know, Dad, for the kingdom and for the king. I want that. I want that. I really do. Because it's the perspective of, it's okay, it's not, it's hard, and someday we'll get out of here. No, it's for the kingdom and for the king. It's now. God created you for a mission. We need to be sons and daughters who are warriors, who are capable of engaging at a level that we do not need to be reassured every moment there is hardship that Jesus loves me, but instead that we are ready to take on the problems and the pain for the sake of the kingdom. And that's what it looks like to live for the kingdom in your problems. And finally, to live for the kingdom in your power. Unlocking God's power is about knowing who God created you to be and why he created you and what he wants to do through you. And as you begin to walk in that, you will unlock all that God has for you. Jesus says it this way. He says that you need to engage him where he is and he will teach you how to walk. 
He says it in an interesting way. He says, when you're tired of banging your head against the wall and not getting anywhere, when you're worn out from fighting on your own, come to me and I will give you rest. Just come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. There's still work for you to do. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That's what Jesus calls us to do. And that's where power comes from. That's where real power comes from. To get in lockstep with Jesus in this life and live it for the fullness of his purpose that he has for you. And when you do that, you'll unlock all that he has for you in walking in your purpose and power and live for the kingdom. I have three stories I want to read to you and I'm going to only read you my favorite one uh, because I know I'm going to get to the end of the notes. But I, I've been looking forward to sharing this story with you for like a month. So I'm going to read you this story about the life of our sixth president, John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams was the sixth president of the United States and the only president to serve a legislative term after being president. So he was president, then he went back to the House of Representatives and he served there consecutively for 18 more years. During that time, his one charge, his one motivation was ending slavery in the Americas. That was his main motivation and focus. And so much that every session he would reintroduce civil petitions, citizens' petitions to try and get, that, that had to be addressed by Congress. That's the way the laws are written. The, those petitions had to be addressed. They had to hear them out. They had to debate them. And one particular day, he showed up with 900 petitions and submitted them all to Congress. And the opposing Southern Whig Party just had had enough of that. And they actually went down to the rules office, changed the rules, and brought back a gag order that said, you can now submit any petition you want to as long as it's not about slavery. Specifically, they singled him out to say, we're not going to hear any of that. And for the next eight years, John Adams continued to be in contempt of court and submit petitions every session. And they would draw him up on charges that were never followed through on, and he would, because he was a former president, right? So he had a little clout. And he would continue to just press the buttons until finally, eight years later, his party was able to remove the gag order so that at least they could actually debate the petitions again. And he presented a seven-step plan that was going to save the nation and bring us out of slavery. And on that day, it was not really a win at all for slavery. It was just a removal of this gag order so we could actually start to talk about it again. As he's leaving Congress that day, a reporter stops him and says, Mr. Adams, how are you able to continue fighting this battle when you've never won? You've never gained a single inch for the emancipation of slavery or the abolishment of slavery in the United States. And he looked at him quickly and simply said, duty is ours, results are God's. And he went on about his way. In 1847, a young man came to serve in Congress as a freshman legislator. Adams took this man under his wing and he became his mentor. It would happen to be that that was John Quincy Adams' last year alive on this earth. He had a heart attack in mid-debate on the Congressional House floor. He was brought over to the Speaker's ante room and there he laid until he passed away two days later. Adams died seeing no fruits of his label and labor and the battle for slavery still unwon. He had never seen the tide move an inch towards the freedom of slavery. But during that one year, he and his apprentice had grown very close, so close that the man was a pallbearer at Adams' funeral. After one term in the legislature, this young man went home, Adams' protege, he returned home and ran for office again and again and again, failing to regain his seat to go back to the Capitol. In fact, he lost multiple elections. However, he finally won one for president of the United States. That man was Abraham Lincoln. The seven-step plan that Abraham Lincoln enacted to bring about the end of slavery was Adam's plan that he had debated for all those years before. 
Duty is ours. Results are God's. I want to read you this one last quote. I've shared this with you before. A Romanian pastor that was under severe oppression, the risk of his life, he was spreading the gospel across Romania, a communist bloc country. And he said, during the interrogation, I told an officer who was threatening to kill me, sir, let me explain how I see this issue. Your supreme weapon is killing and my supreme weapon is dying. Here's how it works. You know that my sermons are on tape, have, spring, have spread all over the country. If you kill me, those sermons will be sprinkled with my blood. Everyone will know I died for my preaching. And everyone who has a tape will pick it up and say, I'd better listen again to what this man preached because he really meant it. He sealed it with his life. So, sir, my sermons will speak 10 times louder than ever before. And I will actually rejoice in this supreme victory if you kill me. And after I said this, the interrogator sent me home. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to ask two things. If you're here this morning and you've never submitted your life to the kingdom and to the king, if you've thought that Christianity and salvation was always just about get me out of here and someday I'll have a home in heaven. And so because of that, you've never stepped across because there's a bigger purpose and calling. I want to ask you to accept Jesus in your life today and to live for a greater purpose through problems with Holy Spirit power. Maybe you're here and you have no clue who you are as a Christian and your Christian experience has not yet allowed you to get on with your mission because you're operating from that ideology that says that Christianity and Jesus is just about making me feel good and leaving me free from conflict and pain. This morning, by the Holy Spirit, I'd like to suggest to you that feeling good about yourself and about life is a prize won by those who have gone through the pressure of God bringing it out in them. They know that their life matters because of the price that's been prayed, paid for it, not just by Jesus, but in their own life, Jesus reproducing the suffering of obedience for the kingdom and for the king. Father, I pray right now that you would strengthen us in our faith, that we would respond in challenge to stand up and say, I will grow up. I will mature. I will be strengthened. I will swim against the culture. I will be a Christian that stands for the kingdom and for the king. I pray that you would work this in us, that it would be a challenge and a call to our hearts and to our lives, that we go home so ready to engage, that we begin to pray, we begin to read the scripture, we begin to come alive in who you've called us to be. Because we are strangers and foreigners to this world. And our home is in the kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives just as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.